Good evening and welcome to our, to our UECM online classes. This is our third class of a four-part session on the Holy Spirit, the quiet members of the Trinity. If you have any questions, please feel free to write it in our YouTube comment box. Please refrain from doing video and audio recording. The recorded video of this class will be uploaded within the week for our review. Our lecturer for tonight is again, Dr. David Dean. He has written several books. His latest book available in Amazon is God's Will Your Way, How to Find and Follow God's Will in Your Life. Now, it's, I think it's also available locally. Before we give this, the floor to Dr. Dean, can we ask our, our church deacon, our third Chua, to start with the word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you once again, O Lord, that we can come together and study your word, study more about you. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we can have Dr. David Dean teach us more about you, to learn more. We thank you that you have the Holy Spirit that you have sent to us to help us to understand you, understand the ways of your thinking, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, as we uh, go through this, uh, the lecture tonight, help us open our eyes, open our hearts to listen to your word. At the same time, O oh Lord, we pray for our speaker, pray that you be with him, um, guide him in the words that he would say and also for each and every listener over uh, open um, make us be aware be more aware about you and how you have worked in our life and lord we pray especially for the internet connection and for for the <clears throat> for the weather that we have right now help us oh lord uh, to be able to have a uh, um, not only a a enlightening and uh, enjoy not enlightening time, O oh Lord, but also an enjoyable time to learn about you. This we all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back, my friends, to our course, The Holy Spirit, Quiet Member of the Trinity. In this third session, we are going to be looking at the filling of the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to move on into a discussion of some special or disputed issues regarding the Holy Spirit. Well, let's begin by doing a little bit of a recap from our last session. In our second session, we examined the works of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ and in salvation and sanctification. Now, we saw that the Holy Spirit was involved in the virgin conception and birth of Christ. He was the divine agent in the conception of Christ. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, the incarnation was accomplished. The Holy Spirit also worked in empowering Christ and also worked in his temptation. The Holy Spirit provided the power for the miracles of Christ and also led him into the wilderness uh, to experience the temptations of the devil, not in order to cause him to fall, but rather to demonstrate his sinlessness through that event. We saw also that there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit serves as a replacement for Christ. He carries on Christ's work of teaching, comforting, and helping believers, and he also works to glorify Christ and to apply his saving work. We saw that the Holy Spirit is involved in the salvation of the lost, and one of the things that he does for the lost is that he restrains sin in the world in general, and he convicts all people regarding their sinfulness. And then the Holy Spirit is involved in the sanctification of the saved. He works in many ways in the lives of saved believers, including sealing and in sanctification. There are many things that we saw that he did. Now, I want to continue our uh, study with uh, attention to a very often misunderstood work, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, we have this command, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, many people have sort of taken this command and uh, looked at the figure of speech that is being used here and actually gotten this idea that there's a sense in which when you get filled, there's more of the Holy Spirit in you than there was before. Um, some people joke, you know, they say, well, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then their friend says, yeah, but you were sinning. And the response is, well, I guess I leaked. Well, you know, that's kind of a funny joke, but it's important for us to understand 
that when scripture talks about the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's not about getting more of the Spirit as if you were missing part of the Spirit. The goal really is for the Holy Spirit to get more of you. And I'll explain that as we move forward. So let's look at the classic passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Paul says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, let me make three initial observations regarding being filled with or by the Holy Spirit. Some Bibles translate it, be filled by the Holy Spirit. First of all, this is a command. God commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is something that God wants us to do. Now that means that being filled, in a sense, is a matter of our choice and it is our responsibility. Another way to put it is that this is not outside of our control or capability. Since God commands us to do it, it must be something that we can do. But then we notice that this is an odd type of command. God doesn't say, fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, which would be an active command. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Literally, in the Greek, it says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a passive command, and it's a command to continue to do this thing. Now, a passive command is a pretty weird idea. Um, Imagine that you are a single woman and you're lonely and you want to be married and someone comes up to you and says, be loved by a handsome, wonderful man. Well, you would say, that's a really weird command. What do you mean, be loved? Um, I don't have control over that person loving me, but grammatically, that's the way this command is actually stated. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a passive command to us. Now, there's an interesting comparison here, isn't there? Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's a comparison between drunkenness and filling, and that comparison is intentional, intentional but the comparison is also intentionally limited. Notice that Paul does not say, do not be drunk with wine, but be drunk with the Spirit. He says, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And that initial observation indicates that there's no suggestion that when a person obeys this command, he loses control of his behavior or he loses responsibility for his behavior. Now, what I want to do next is compare this whole idea of being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. And what I'm going to show you here is probably not something you've seen before. I've done a lot of study on this passage, and it's really quite fascinating. So we're going to compare being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit, and I'll make some comments about each one of them. Now, first, let's look at the similarities between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. First of all, when a person gets drunk, it's a voluntary choice. Now, I will admit to you that I have been drunk a few times in my life. Um, They're in my teenage years and in my college years. And in order to get drunk, I had to choose to drink alcohol. Now, it's interesting because of the comparison between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit, it's obvious that being filled with the Spirit is also a voluntary choice. Now, you have to choose to submit to the influence of either alcohol or the spirit. And without an act of the will, you will neither be drunk nor will you be filled. In other words, in both of these cases, you are responsible for your choice. Now, secondly, when you compare being drunk with wine and being filled with the spirit, there's another similarity. Drunkenness changes your capabilities. Being filled with the Spirit also changes your capabilities. Now, there's a sense in which both of these 
have an influence on us. When you're under the influence of alcohol or whether you're, when you're under the influence of the spirit, your capabilities change. Now, we'll say more about the change in capabilities in a moment. Now, there's yet another similarity. Um, when a person is drunk with wine or drunk with alcohol, it's a temporary condition. Now, you've probably all run into drunken people on the street who will come up to you and they will beg for money so that they can get another drink. Now, the reason they need another drink is that if they stop drinking, they will stop being drunk. You have to keep on drinking in order to stay drunk. Well, when Paul says, be being filled with the Spirit, the same idea is present. The idea is that it takes continued effort to maintain the state of being filled with the Spirit. Both drunkenness and filling with the Spirit require continued effort to maintain. Now, the last similarity between these two things is that both of these happen in degrees. Now, you can be a little drunk or you can be a lot drunk. There are many different levels of drunkenness. In fact, in America, if you are uh, pulled over by a policeman for driving when you have been drinking, there are different levels of blood alcohol and the amount of penalty that you will be subject to if you are caught drinking and driving will depend on how much alcohol is in your blood. Now, the implication here is also that being filled with the Spirit happens in degrees. And I would suggest, uh, because of this, that one is never fully drunk and one is never fully Spirit-filled. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit later. But there are also differences between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. Obviously, wine is just a physical liquid. It is an impersonal and amoral thing. Um, wine isn't a person, and uh, wine or alcohol is not an evil thing. Um, it's just a substance. However, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an impersonal substance. He is a person and he is moral. The Holy Spirit is a person and he is good. And obviously the things that he wants to do in the life, life of a believer is good. So I would argue that wine reduces our inhibitions and it, that typically leads to dissipation and immorality. Now that's an interesting thing to think about. If human beings were not sinful, then drinking wine might make them stumble around or not be able to speak clearly, but it wouldn't lead to sinful behavior. But because we are sinful, if a person drinks too much wine and that results in a lowering of his inhibitions, typically what happens is that he will um, behave in a more overtly sinful way. He won't try to hide his sin so much, and he may go deeper into sin than he would if he were sober. Now, the Holy Spirit is different. The Holy Spirit, because he's both personal and moral, he actually strengthens the conscience when a person is filled with the Spirit, and that leads to purposeful and godly living. So, obviously, um, this is a big difference. When a person is drunk, that tends to lead to sinful behavior, but because the Holy Spirit is personal and good, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, we will see the fruits of the Spirit. We will see the benefits of the Spirit helping that believer live in a more godly and spiritually fruitful way. Now, here we come to the second difference between being drunk with wine and filled with the Spirit. When a person is drunk with wine, it reduces his capabilities. And we all know this because one of the classic tests for a person who is drunk is that the policeman will take him out of his car and ask him to walk in a straight line. And any sober person can walk in a straight line, but a drunk person typically cannot. Drunkenness reduces your capabilities. But when a person is filled with the Spirit, it increases his capabilities. To put it another way, drunkenness makes one less useful and less of a blessing. But when the Holy Spirit fills a person, 
that person is going to bear spiritual fruit and that's going to make that individual more useful, more of a blessing, someone you want to have around because he is going to be a blessing in other people's lives. So I think it's very interesting to look at the way that Paul lays this out and he compares being drunk with wine and being filled with the spirit. And we see that there are similarities and there are differences. Now, the question still remains, how can a person be filled with the spirit? Paul tells us that we should do it, but the question is, does he tell us how to do it? Well, let me suggest that the way we find the answer to how to be filled with the spirit comes from a comparison between the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians. Now, many of you have probably noticed that Ephesians and Colossians are very similar in many ways. They contain a lot of similar commands. They were both written by Paul when he was in prison. Um, many people view these as sister letters. And at the end of the, book, the letter to the Colossians, um, Paul says, be sure to read the letter uh, to the Laodiceans. And many people think that Ephesians is actually the letter to the Laodiceans. And that's an interesting other topic I won't go into right now. Now, there's an interesting comparison if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, 18 to 20, and Colossians 3, 16 to 17. Now, let me turn to Colossians and just read that passage to you. Okay, Colossians 3, 16. Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Now, when you lay out Ephesians 5, 18, and Colossians 3, 16 to 17, side by side, a very interesting parallel shows up. Now, at the beginning, you don't see the parallel. In Ephesians, we have the command, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, we have the statement, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, there doesn't seem to be any similarity between these two commands, but look what follows. In Ephesians, continuing on, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then Colossians 3.16b, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It almost looks like the same statement. And then if we go further, in Ephesians, Paul continues, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. And in Colossians 3.17, giving thanks to God the Father. Now, what I'm going to do next is a little tricky logically. And the point that I want to make here is that it's not absolutely certain that since these verses end the same way, that the way that they begin is connected. But let me suggest to you that in this particular case, they are. All right, the similarity between the ends of these passages seems to suggest it does not necessarily require in a logical sense, but I think it's at least plausible that the very first part of each one of these passages um, is equivalent to the first part of the other. Now, here's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that when Paul says, be filled by the Spirit, and by the way, let me explain to you um, why I put the word controlled in there. Let me suggest to you that in this case, being filled by the Spirit is achieved by the thing that we see on the other side in Colossians, by believing obedience to the Word of God. Now, where do I get believing obedience to the Word of God? Well, I get it from this command, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, if you imagine the word of God dwelling in a person, well, that means that you've taken it in. But if it's going to dwell in you richly, what's it going to do? It's going to produce fruit. It's going to affect the way you live. And so I'm suggesting here 
that the way you become filled by the Spirit is by knowing what the Word of God says, obeying the Word of God, and let me add in relying upon the Spirit for power. That's where the Spirit comes into the picture. Now, let me just jump out to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 5, and I want to look for just a couple of minutes at the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, most of you know this story. In the end of Acts chapter 4, we see Barnabas selling a piece of land and bringing the money and giving it to the church to help the church at this time of persecution. Well, Ananias and Sapphira also own a piece of land and they uh, sell the piece of land. They take the money and what they do is they keep some of the money, but they tell the church that they're giving all of the money. So we read in verse 2, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3, but Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Now, this is really a fascinating incident. What's going on here is that Peter, apparently being informed by the Holy Spirit, knows that Ananias is lying when he says, here is all the money from the sale of the land. And how does Peter describe what has just happened? He says, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And the verb filled that he uses here is exactly the same one that we see in the book of Ephesians. Now, the idea here is that Ananias has al allowed Satan to control him. He's allowed Satan to influence him to tell this lie. And so that's why I say that being filled with the Spirit really means to be controlled by the Spirit. It means to submit to the control of the Spirit, allowing him to guide your behavior. Now, putting all the information together, I am suggesting to you that the way to be filled, that is to be controlled by the Spirit, is believing obedience to the word of God while relying upon the spirit for power. Now let's explore this just a little bit further, but before we explore it, let me give you an illustration. Uh, a few of you know my son, Caleb. Caleb was our first child. Um, he is now a fine young man. He's a doctor in his fourth year of residency. But Caleb was one of the most difficult babies that we have ever known or heard of. Caleb, for the first six months of his life, never slept for more than an hour or perhaps 45 minutes at a time. And he was a very difficult baby to take care of. We would have to get up frequently in the middle of the night to feed him. I was in seminary at the time, and you can imagine that being a full-time seminary student, working part-time, my wife was also working part-time, and we had this baby who was just wearing us out. We lived on the seminary campus, and all of our neighbors knew who Caleb was because they would hear him wake up and scream wanting to eat in the middle of the night. Well, Caleb was wearing on my nerves particularly, and one night, as usually happened, he started screaming, and, and our procedure was that I would get up, I would bring him to my wife, she would nurse him, then I would take him, I'd change his diaper and I'd put him back in bed. And we'd go through this cycle five or six times through the night. It was very exhausting. Well, one night I had to get up and I went in to take care of Caleb, bring him to my wife, and I looked down at him and I was just exhausted. And I, and I remember thinking in my head, I hate this kid. This kid is ruining our lives. And I hate to say this, but to be very honest, at that moment, I almost felt like picking him up and throwing him out 
the window. Now, when that thought came to my mind, it scared me. And I got down on my knees and Caleb is still wailing at the top of his lungs. I got down on my knees and I said, God, I can't take this anymore. I don't have the strength or the patience to take care of this baby. And if I keep on going the way I'm going, I'm going to do something terrible. But I know that you want me to love this child. I know that you want me to care for this child. I know what your word says, but I can't do it myself. You have to do it through me. Please give me the strength to do what your word says I should do. And I finished my prayer and I got up and I took care of my son and brought him to the other room. My wife nursed him. I put him back to bed after changing his diaper and we just continued. Now, personally, I think that that's a very good illustration of the filling of the Holy Spirit. See, what happened was I knew what the word said I should do, but I didn't have the strength to do it. I asked God to give me the strength to do it, and then I got up and I did it. And I believe that the power to do that came from God because I didn't have the strength to do it anymore. Well, let's look at some conclusions on the filling of the Spirit. First of all, what does the command be filled with the Spirit mean? Well, I believe that it means submit willingly to the Spirit's control and influence, and that comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Secondly, how can I submit to the Spirit's control? Well, first of all, I need to know what the Word of God says. I need to know what God wants me to do. I need to believe the Word of God, and then I need to take the initiative to obey the Word of God while relying upon the power of the Spirit. Now, this is a subtle thing, but I believe that this is what it's about. It's saying, I know what God wants me to do. I don't have the strength to do it. I'm going to ask God to give me the strength to do it, and then I'm going to get up and do it. Now, let's talk about practical steps involved in the filling of the Spirit. Well, negatively, we've already seen that Paul commands us not to grieve the Spirit. And in our study of the grieving of the Spirit, we saw that the context where that command was being given is in Ephesians, where Paul is saying that the purpose of the church is to bring glory to Christ and one of the ways we do it is by maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the body. And we do that by avoiding sinning against other believers. And on the contrary, by loving other believers, by exercising our spiritual gifts, by being kind, by being uh, forgiveness, forgiving. So grieve not the Spirit means don't sin against other believers. When you do, confess your sin, turn back to obedience, and also be forgiving to those who sin against you. Now, the second negative command we've also seen is don't quench the Spirit. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Now, let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 13. Romans 6.13, Paul says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. In other words, don't resist the Spirit. Yield to the Spirit's control. Do what you know God wants you to do. And of course, there's Romans 12, 1 and 2, which basically bring us back to the same idea. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So negatively, don't grieve the Spirit, don't quench the Spirit. Now positively, Paul says, walk in the Spirit. And I believe walk in the Spirit is really another figure that is basically the same as be filled with the Spirit. But walk in the Spirit emphasizes the initiative. Step out. Take the initiative to obey God's Word 
And as you do so, rely upon the Spirit's help. Now remember, the Spirit's indwelling is permanent. There's no such thing as a believer who does not have the indwelling Spirit. But the Spirit's filling is temporary. Second, staying filled with the Spirit takes effort just as staying drunk takes effort. Now, Paul says, be being filled with the Spirit. This is not one of these commands to do something once that's going to have continuing uh, effects that never go away. Filling of the Spirit is not a one-time achievement. It's something that takes effort. It's something that takes repetitive effort. Now, thirdly, filling comes in degrees. It's not an all-or-nothing condition. Now, Let me explain this, and and I brought this up before, but I think I need to explain this a little bit more clearly. When we understand the filling of the Spirit as obeying the commands of Scripture, taking the initiative to do so while relying on the Spirit, there are many different commands in the Scriptures, and some of the commands are negative, don't do this, and other commands are positive, do this. Now, I would argue that for any Christian there are many areas of our life. We've got our dealings with money. We've got our dealings with our family members. We've got our relationship to government. We've got, um, you know, uh, sexual issues. There are many different issues in the life of a believer. And I would argue that if we understand filling correctly, it's possible to be filled in one portion of your life and not filled in another. In other words, it's possible to be obedient to God in one part of your life and not in another. So I don't think that we should view filling as when you're filled, everything in your life is right. I would argue that when you're filled, the portions of your life that where you're being obedient to God are right, but there may be other portions that are not right. Now, lastly, That's the point that I was just making. One may be filled in one area of behavior and not in another. And going back to the previous point, um, I believe that there are degrees of obedience. Um, some, Some obedience is greater than others. So filling comes in degrees and it's not necessarily uh, filling all the areas of your life. Now let's look at some practical implications regarding spirit filling and in particular what spirit filling is not. First of all, you need to exert an effort in order to be filled, and this is a continual effort. That means that filling is not automatic. And here, the point that I really want to make is we shouldn't be praying for the Holy Spirit to fill us. We're not told to ask the Spirit to fill us. We are told to be filled with the Spirit. Let me put that another way. The Spirit has already provided everything that we need in order for us to obey this command. We've got the Scriptures, we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, and He is ready and willing to give us the power to obey. But it's our job to take the initiative. So filling is not automatic. It's something that we must exert an effort to do. Now secondly, you can't be filled by the Spirit without a knowledge of God's Word. If the filling of the Spirit is active obedience to God's Word while relying on the Spirit to give you the power, well, if you don't know God's Word, you're not going to be able to be filled, at least in the portion of God's Word that relates to the particular area of life. So I would argue that filling isn't for the biblically ignorant, right? If you want to be more filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to know what God's Word says. Now, third, faith in the truth of Scripture is necessary for filling. Now, when I'm talking about the truth of Scripture, I'm not just talking about believing the Gospel. I'm talking about um, commands involving interpersonal relationships. For example, in the book of Ephesians, Paul tells employees to submit to their employers and to work hard to be good employees. Now, you need to trust that that's the right thing to do in order to do it. So in that sense, faith in the truth of Scripture is necessary to filling because you're not going to obey it if you don't believe what Scripture tells you to do is right. 
In other words, filling is not for the unbelieving. And here I don't mean just unbelievers who aren't saved people. I'm talking about saved people who may not believe that the commands of Scripture are the best thing for them. Now, fourth, since no one knows, understands, and obeys all of Scripture, it's unlikely that anyone will be filled in all areas of his or her life. Now, the point that I'm making here is that filling is not all or nothing. Um, again, it's possible to be filled in some areas of your life and not in other areas. Now, the fifth point, remember, be filled is a command and no believer is always obedient. This by itself would suggest that the filling of the spirit is not permanent. And obviously the fact that Paul says, be being filled by the spirit also suggests that it's not permanent. Now here's the last thing, and this is a big deal. When you are filled by the spirit, you are a blessing to other people. The filling of the spirit is primarily for the benefit of blessing other people. It's not primarily for my benefit, although I would argue strongly that when one is being filled by the spirit, blessing comes to him. And, and that blessing may simply be the joy of being a blessing to someone else. Now, when you are filled with the spirit, when you are walking in the spirit, other people will recognize that and they will benefit. You will make their lives better. And so the point I wanna make here is that filling is not a purely personal internal experience. If you are being filled with the spirit, there are going to be outward manifestations and those manifestations will primarily show up in the way that you're a blessing to other people. Well, now I wanna step a little bit outside of this topic to just deal with the general question of why it is that we need to struggle to be obedient to the word of God. Uh, you might think, you know, now that I'm saved, I have the indwelling Holy Spirit. It should be easy to obey God. It should be easy to be filled with the spirit. But that's not the general experience of Christians, right? Let's take a look at this. Here's the question. Many people ask, ask it this way. Why is my Christian life such a struggle? Now, I want you to notice that I've divided the screen into three parts here. We've got before salvation, after salvation, during mortal life, and then your life in glorification. Now, I've skipped over the intermediate state between the time of your death and when you get your resurrection body, but it doesn't really change the picture significantly. Now, before you were saved, according to biblical terminology that we've seen, you were in the flesh. After you're saved, according to biblical terminology that we've seen, you are in the spirit. You are also in Christ. So notice that once you cross the line from before salvation into salvation life, you are in Christ and you continue to be in Christ forever after that. You continue to be in the spirit. Now, before you were saved, what were you? You were a spiritually dead person living in mortal sinful flesh. You were in this kind of body, the body that sort of inherits the sin nature of Adam. In that condition, before you were saved, you were completely against God. There was nothing in you that wanted to please God. And Paul says in Romans 8, 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, what's going to happen after you reach glorification? Well, when you are glorified, you will be a spiritually alive person. Remember, you get regenerated when you're saved and you will be in an eternal sinless resurrection body. Your new resurrection body will have no sin nature. In that condition, you will be completely for God. In fact, you will never sin again. Now, Romans 8, 29 looks forward to that condition when it speaks of God saying, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of, your, of his son. So that's where we're headed. But where are we now? During your mortal life, after you're saved, before you exit mortal life, you are a spiritually alive person 
living in mortal sinful flesh. Now, this is a condition of conflict. Paul describes his own experience as a saved mortal. And he says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practiced. Now, if you're like me, and if you're honest with yourself, you realize that there's a battle going on in here. Paul describes it in Galatians. He says, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants control of you, but your sinful nature also wants control of you. And it's during mortal life where you need to make a choice how you are going to walk. Are you going to continue in your old sinful practices, which were characteristic of you before you were saved? Or are you going to seek to obey God in the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, let me make this a little bit more concrete by talking about the issue of reward in the believer's life. Now, I'm making up a hypothetical situation here. And by the way, let me tell you the story behind the visual that I'm about to share with you. Um, when I was uh, still serving in the Philippines, I was in invited to give a talk to some uh, mainland Chinese students who were in the Asian Institute of Management. And I knew that they were very much in, interested in money and in mathematical things. So I decided to sort of do a mathematical presentation of the whole issue of reward in the believer's life. Now, what I'm showing you on the screen is a hypothetical situation involving three different individuals. Now they're all born on the same day and they all die on the same day. So they all have exactly the same length of life. In fact, they all live through exactly the same time period. And of these three people, um, they're going to be saved on different days. One is going to be saved on his deathbed, perhaps days before he dies. One is going to be saved probably in his retirement life, and one is going to be saved during his college years. Now, I'm plotting here on the vertical scale, sanctification and fruitfulness. Now, I don't think that sanctification and fruitfulness are a single um, dimension in the believer's life. I believe there are multiple dimensions. But to make it simple, we're just going to talk about zero sanctification and 100% sanctification. And here we're talking about the condition of progressive sanctification. We're not talking about positional sanctification because every believer is 100% positionally sanctified. But when I'm talking about sanctification, I'm talking about the amount of, of spiritual fruit that the person is bearing in his life. Um, I'm talking about his battle against sin. And when he's at 100%, it means that he's serving God very well and there's no ongoing sin in his life. When he's down at zero, He's not bearing any spiritual fruit. Now, this is oversimplified, but I think you'll get the picture. So we look at the first guy. He gets saved on his deathbed. And in the brief few days that he remains alive after he is saved, he grows spiritually very rapidly. He reads his Bible a lot. He prays a lot. He testifies about his salvation to the people in the hospital where he's lying on his deathbed. And in that brief period of time, he bears a lot of spiritual fruit, but not for very long. Now, then we've got the second believer. Let's say he gets saved maybe in his late 50s or in his 60s. Now, he lives quite a bit longer, a good number of years. And during that time, he grows spiritually, but he reaches a certain peak and then he backslides during the latter part of his life. And he's not very fruitful in the latter days of his life. Well, then we come to the third individual and he gets saved during his college years and he grows a good bit. He backslides a little bit, then he grows some more. And then for the latter part of his life, he's just sort of hovering at the same level, roughly of sanctification. Well, they all die on the same day. And when they die, they leave behind their sinful nature. And in that sense, they move to 100% sanctification. Now they wait during the intermediate state until the rapture. And during that period of time, they're awaiting their resurrection and reward. <clears throat> and then they will be uh, glorified. They get their resurrection bodies 
and they will also receive their rewards. Now, look at the hint I've given you on the screen here. What I'm suggesting <clears throat> is that the guy who got saved first, the orange guy, has a much bigger reward than either the other two guys. And it has to do with the length of time that they served God in uh, and their state of sanctification. Now, the first point that I want you to get here is that you can only earn reward. You can only put treasure in heaven while you are a saved mortal saint struggling against sin. In other words, the only time in your existence where you can build treasure in heaven is between the day of your salvation and the day of your mortal death, because that's the only time period during which your choice of whether to serve God and how, uh, how deeply, how effectively um, to serve God. That's the only time when it matters. Before you're saved, you can't please God. And after you are glorified, there's no way for you to displease God. So it makes sense that it's only during your saved mortal life that God is going to give you reward, or to put it another way, it's only during that time that you can build up treasure in heaven. Well, for you calculus buffs, this is what it looks like. Your reward is the integral from T naught, which is the day of your salvation until TF, which is the day of your death, of the product of your fruitfulness and your sanctification, right? There's, there's the explanation of the figures on the screen. And uh, I think that there is a little bit of sense to this. Now, God's way of calculating your reward, I don't think is a unidimensional, uh, you know, integral, but the basic idea here is correct. In other words, your reward is going to be proportionate to the area under the curve of your sanctification over the period of time that you are a believer in mortal life. Well, that's just kind of for entertainment. You can think about that. Um, this is only a speculation on my part. I didn't get this out of the Bible per se, although I think it basically reflects biblical concepts. Well, it's time to move on to special issues regarding the Holy Spirit. And let's see how far we can get. I see three special issues regarding the Holy Spirit that we need to talk about. Now, the first one is differences between the ministry of the Holy Spirit to individuals in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, or more specifically before and after the cross. Secondly, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we're gonna be talking about the nature and purpose of spiritual gifts, so-called sign gifts, and some practical considerations regarding spiritual gifts, and thirdly, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. These are the topics that we're going to be devoting the rest of tonight's session to, and also our fourth session to, and we'll see how far we get tonight. Well, let's start with the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Well, let's examine what the Holy Spirit was doing in the Old Testament era. Now, we've got a number of familiar scriptures from the book of Judges, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Now in context, this is talking about Samson. And then when Delilah cuts Samson's hair, we are told, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. In other words, the on-dwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit stopped when Samson allowed Delilah to cut his hair. Now, all four of these incidents in the book of Judges involve individuals who were empowered by the Holy Spirit for special tasks. And these were typically warfare when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, obviously this ministry of the Spirit to them was temporary, it was not permanent. How do we know that? Because of the example of Samson. The Spirit came upon him, and then the Spirit departed from him. This is not the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that we see in New Testament times. This is Old Testament on dwelling. Now, here's another interesting example. We've got Balaam. Now, Balaam is a baffling character in the Old Testament. It's hard to know 
whether he is a disobedient believer or whether he's just a pagan whom God uses to uh, bring a message to Israel and whom God uses to frustrate the efforts of Balak to uh, oppose the Israelites. Now, the spirit even came upon Balaam. What do we read? Balaam raised his eyes and the spirit of God came upon him. And the result of the spirit coming upon him is that he gives a true prophecy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Was he a believer? Or wasn't he a believer? Tough question to answer. I don't know the answer. Well, then we have the case of Saul. Now, this is what we read. So it was when he, Saul, had turned back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. Now, I believe that this is a reference to the regeneration of Saul. I believe that this is referring to Saul being saved. Now, the evidence of Scripture is that in the Old Testament times, as well as in New Testament times, once a person is regenerated, that person is secure in his salvation. He cannot lose his salvation. But then we read this about Saul in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And then in the next verse, we read, the spirit of the Lord came upon David. Well, what's going on here? Here's what I would argue. Although Saul was regenerated by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the agent of regeneration all through Scripture. The Spirit's empowering ministry for Saul, for Saul the coming upon ministry that gave Saul the ability to lead Israel and to be a good military leader was withdrawn from him. That again shows that the Spirit's empowering ministry for Saul was a temporary thing. Now, what about the post-cross ministry of the Holy Spirit? Well, here's what we read in John chapter 7, verse 39. But this he spoke, this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been resurrected. And this passage is telling us that the giving of the Holy Spirit in the sense of indwelling the believer is something that could not happen until the resurrection of Jesus. Now, here's a familiar verse that we've looked at before, Romans 8, 9. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, all true believers do have the indwelling Holy Spirit. So what conclusions can we draw from the evidence that we're seeing here? Well, the Old Testament coming upon work of the Spirit involved empowerment for a particular task. It was not necessarily associated with salvation or regeneration, and it could be withdrawn. So therefore, before Pentecost, there was no permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The ondwelling provided power for specific tasks assigned by God, and the ondwelling was temporary in the sense that it was not permanent. It could be withdrawn. Nonetheless, let's be clear that Old Testament believers were secure in their salvation like New Testament believers because of God's promise. Now, we see that in the comparison of Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Paul compares that to the New Testament believer in Romans chapter 4. And the Old Testament believer was secure in his salvation because we know, according to Romans chapter 3, and I won't go there now, that when Christ died on the cross, he was paying for the sins of Old Testament believers. He paid for all of their sins. So anybody, any Old Testament believer who put his faith in God's promises and was saved as an Old Testament saint had all of his sins forgiven in the sense that they were eternally forgiven. They could not send him to hell. Now, all, we also know that Old Testament believers were regenerated like New Testament believers because they were spiritually dead before they were saved, and then they were made alive. Now, Ezekiel 8.31 says this, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and give yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. And the idea is 
that when an Old Testament uh, individual was saved, God did give him a new heart and a new spirit. In other words, that person was regenerated. So here we see the difference between the spirits pre and post cross ministries. Well, let's move on to the nature and purpose of spiritual gifts. And we'll see how far we get with this. We may not get through this entire session section, but let's talk about it. There are four key new, new Testament texts on spiritual gifts. First Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, Romans chapter 12, verses three to eight, Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 16, and first Peter chapter four, verses 10 to 11. Now it's interesting to look at the dates of these. The first is AD 56, the next is AD 57. Ephesians was written around AD 61, and 1 Peter was written around AD 63. Now these four texts lay out the basic truths regarding spiritual gifts. So I wanna look at each one of them and focus on the central truths that are expressed by each one of these passages. And then we will address controversial issues afterwards. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11. Paul says, there are diversity of, of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of knowledge through the spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Well, what key concepts come out of this passage? First of all, you see that the gifts, ministries, and activities of believers vary, but the power that they exercise in all true spiritual gifts comes from the triune God, from the Spirit, Son, and Father. Now, there's something very interesting in this passage. If you look at it carefully, you see the Spirit, the Son, and the Father mentioned, verse 4, but there, there are diff diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, there are difference of differences of ministries, but the same Lord, that's Christ. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. That's God the Father. So although we tend to look at spiritual gifts and associate the power that comes with them primarily with the Holy Spirit, Paul is telling us that all three members of the Trinity are at work in the lives of believers and associated with the work of, the Holy, with the work of spiritual gifts. Now, secondly, this passage tells us that the Holy Spirit bestows, bestows specific spiritual gifts on specific individuals, but it's for the benefit of the body as a whole. Now, we have a partial list of spiritual gifts here. They include something called word of wisdom, word of knowledge. I believe that both of those have to do with the ability to interpret and apply scripture in a practical way. There's the gift of faith. That's the gift of a special degree of trust in God. There are gifts of healings, workings of miracles. Those two seem to be miraculous. There's the gift of prophecy. Now, there's a little bit of a question here. Is the gift of prophecy the ability to make predictions of future events, or is it the ability to preach? Because the word prophecy is often used in the New Testament, probably more often, to refer to preaching. And I personally tend to think that this is about preaching. Then there's the gift of discerning of spirits. Now, is this supernatural or is this simply a spiritual gift that allows one to have a strong insight into identifying false teaching and false teachers? I tend to think that it's the latter. There's the gift of tongues, which we'll be talking about later and the interpretation of tongues. We'll come to those again later. Now, Paul makes the point that the Holy Spirit sovereignly chooses which gift he will bestow upon each individual. Now there's a strong emphasis here upon the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit and the role of individual believers as servants of the body as a whole. Well, now we come to 
a latter part within 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to jump over the middle. You'll see the three dots there where I jump. Starting with verse 12, Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Now, jumping down to verse 27, Paul says, now you are the body of Christ. The you there is plural and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now we're going to come back to the very last verse there, verse 31, a little bit later. But for now, let's move on and look at the key ideas that come out of this passage. The first thing that we see is that the body of Christ has many members. Now the idea is that each one of us is an arm or a leg or an ear or an eye or something like that. It's a figure of speech. The many members are individual believers who are joined to the body at the moment of salvation in that instantaneous invisible work called spirit baptism. Now no part, no member, no person who is part of the body of Christ is independent from the rest of the body and no person, no part of the body is unneeded. Whoever you are, if you are part of the body of Christ, you are needed. Now, Paul makes the point here that God has sovereignly appointed people as gifts. It's interesting. Here, he talks about apostles, prophets, and teachers. And he also talks about gifts that are given to people. And these are the gift of miracles, of healings, of helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Now, some of these appear to be miraculous and others are not miraculous per se. Now, Paul very strongly makes the point that no one has all of the roles. Not everybody is an apostle, a prophet, or a teacher, and nobody has all of the gifts. And what he's going to do at the end of this chapter is he's going to lead into chapter 13, where he makes the point, which is the best way for the body to function is in love. What matters more than the spiritual gift you have is how you treat other people. And you should be treating other members of the body with love. Now, we, again, we'll come back to the proper interpretation of the last verse of chapter 12 a little bit later. I hope we get to it tonight. We'll see. Now, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8, another important passage. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Well, here are the key concepts that come out of this passage. Paul says that believers should not elevate themselves in their thinking, but instead view themselves soberly. And sober, sober thinking is not that I'm nobody, and it's not that I'm the most important person. It's that I'm part of the body and I have a contribution to make. Now, Paul points out that the diversity and the independence of the human body, the parts of the human body, illustrate the diversity and independence, interdependence, I'm sorry, not independence, interdependence of the body of Christ. Paul says that because God has given each person a different gift, we should serve each other with our respective gifts. 
whether it's prophecy, which I think is preaching, whether it's service, ministry, whether it's teaching, etc. Um, also exhorting. Now, he says that givers should give liberally, leaders should lead diligently, the merciful should show mercy cheerfully. Note that in this list of gifts, which is only given one year after the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we've got only one gift that might be miraculous in nature. That's the gift of prophecy. And personally, I think the gift of prophecy is the gift of preaching, which is not miraculous per se. Well, now we come to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Paul says, and he himself, that's Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every word of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Well, what are the key ideas here? We're told here that Christ gave people as gifts to the church. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists, and he gave a kind of person that is a pastor teacher. Now, their role is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, and that will result in the building up of Christ's body. Now, the very first goal of this process is to bring the body to unity in doctrine knowledge of Christ and to maturity that reflects the character of Christ. The second goal, immunity to false teaching. In a church where there is solid teaching and preaching, the believers will know the truth well enough that they will not be led aside by false teaching. The third goal is the ability to speak the truth in love. Fourth goal, the mutually beneficial functioning of all the members in the body and the growth of the entire body in Christ. So everybody grows up together. Now it's interesting. This list of gifts includes only people. Apostles were only given once, they're all dead. The term prophets might refer to individuals who received direct revelation, but it more likely refers to preachers, in my opinion. Well, then we come to our last passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. Peter says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. Key concepts here. Every believer without exception was given a spiritual gift at the moment of salvation. How do we know this? Because Peter says that everybody has a gift and that couldn't be true unless everybody is given a spiritual gift at the moment of salvation. Peter says that every believer has the duty to use his gift in serving other believers. He says that using one spiritual gift is proper stewardship of the multifaceted or manifold grace of God. Those who speak should speak as God's spokespersons, not sharing their own opinions. Those who serve should exercise the abilities that God has given to them. And the goal, as we use our spiritual gifts, is to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. Now, the important point that comes out of this, I think, most important, is that no believer can say, I am not gifted. Every believer has a spiritual gift and the failure to use your spiritual gift is poor stewardship and ultimately it's robbing God of the glory that he deserves. Now here I'm going to very quickly give you a list of the spiritual gifts and also the persons who are given as gifts that are listed in the New Testament epistles. And as we go through this uh, table, 
I'm identifying where each one of these is mentioned in the scriptures by letters A, B, C, D, and E. Now, the one that I've added here is Mark chapter 16, which talks about special uh, abilities given to the apostles. And we will be looking at Mark 16 next week. So we've got word of wisdom. Oh, by the way, I've listed, if it says M, it's miraculous. If it's N, it's a non-miraculous gift. And in some cases, it's not entirely clear which is which. So we've got word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, which I think is preaching, the gift of prophet, which might have something to do with revelation, um, the discerning of spirits, speech in tongues, interpretation of tongues, ministry or service or helper. It's translated different ways in different translations. The person who is an apostle, the gift of teaching, the person who's a pastor teacher, the gift of exhortation, the gift of giving, the gift of leading or administrations, the person who is the evangelist, the gift of mercy, and the gift of speaking. Now, this, I believe, is a complete list of all the gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament. That doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other spiritual gifts, but these are the ones that we know about. Now, on this next slide, I'm going to show you my personal opinion regarding which of these gifts are not apostolic sign gifts that are listed in Mark. And again, we'll be looking at Mark 16 later. Which of these are not unique persons who are appointed by Christ for the early church? And which of these are not predicted to cease or to vanish in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Now, in this course, we don't have time to go through 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let me simply say that I think a weak argument for the cessation of some of the gifts can be made from 1 Corinthians 13, but I don't think it's a very strong argument. Now, my opinion is that the ones I've got highlighted in orange are gifts that don't fall into the above category. In other words, these are the kinds of gifts that we should expect to still be being given in the church today if we believe that uh, the sign gifts are no longer being given as I do. Now, some possible exceptions to this are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Some people would argue that these are miraculous gifts. Personally, I don't think that they are. Now, let's look at some conclusions that come from our basic study of spiritual gifts. First, the triune God distributes gifts by his sovereign choice. Second, he's given miraculous gifts, non-miraculous gifts, and people as gifts. Third, every believer has at least one gift distributed by the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion when he baptizes the new believer into the body of Christ. Gifts are for mutual service. They're not for self-service. And that mutual service should result in mutual edification, mutual appreciation and reliance. It should bring greater health of the body as a whole. It should bring doctrinal strength and it should bring glory to God. The failure to exercise one's gift is a failure at stewardship. Now, it's very interesting. When we looked at these four passages, it seems that the mention of the miraculous gifts really ends very quickly in the sequence of the writing of the New Testament. And that seems to suggest to me that even the apostles miraculous gifts, which we will be talking about next time when we look, look at Mark 16, didn't last forever. Final point, no one has or should he expect to have all of the gifts. Now, this is God's intent and design. He wants us to be mutually dependent, which will lead to mutual appreciation and love of other members of the body. Now, here are some common questions about spiritual gifts. I'm very close to the end, but let me finish this one slide. How can I know what my spiritual gift is? Do gifts vary in their nature? Are all gifts available today? And may I ask God to give me a gift that he didn't give me at my conversion? Well, let me give you some initial answers to these questions, and then we'll stop and move on to our question and answer session. How can I know what my gift is? Well, my advice is start serving in the church. Do what you were asked to do. 
see what works. And very often you will discover what your spiritual gift is when you discover the ways in which your service to others is especially fruitful. Now, secondly, listen to feedback from other people. When a person tells you, you really blessed me by what you did, that's usually an indication that the thing that you did is related to your spiritual gifts. Now, I'm not a big fan of spiritual gift inventories, but I think they can be helpful and you might want to consider using them. Now, do gifts vary in their nature? Are all gifts very uh, available today? Well, yes, gifts do vary in their nature. Some of them are obviously supernatural, like the gift of miraculous healings, and others are not so obviously supernatural. Some are only by divine appointment, such as the gift of apostle, which is not being given today. Now, whether the supernatural gifts, which are often called the sign gifts, are available today is debated, and we will be talking about that in our fourth session. Now, the last question, may I ask God to give me a gift that he didn't give me at the time of my conversion? Well, my answer is that it's probably not wrong to ask God for another gift. However, and we'll have to save this for next time unless we're going to deal with this during our question and answer session. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 seems to be a command to ask for other gifts, but I think that our Bibles are mostly uh, incorrectly translated there. I don't think that Paul is telling us to seek the best gifts. And the last point that I'd make before we finish is, shouldn't we trust the Holy Spirit's wisdom? The Holy Spirit is wise, and he chose to give each one of us a gift or possibly more than one gift at the moment of our salvation. Shouldn't we trust his wisdom and accept that his choice was the best choice? Well, I'm going to stop here, and I will um, ask Pastor Terrence to take us now to our question and answer session. Let me just put up the Q&A um, slide here. It takes me a minute to get there. There we are. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Dean, for, uh, for this time of teaching. Uh, it's really I'm eye-opening for a lot of people. And I have questions uh, that are related directly to our session today. Uh, there are also questions that we have recorded that we have received uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start with questions that are asked last week. Okay. Um, in the Holy Spirit-based healing crusades, uh, for example, like the Benihin, how can we know if it is the Holy Spirit working or the evil spirit working. Mm. I think you have, you did mention, but you did not uh, about the working of the Holy Spirit, but maybe you want to address this question. Well, I am highly suspicious of these Holy Spirit crusades um, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, studies have been made of these crusades and it's been shown without a shadow of a doubt that the people who run these crusades uh, screen the people who come for healing and they will typically prevent anybody from coming in to ask for healing who has the kind of an ailment where the cure would be very obvious. They usually only allow people in who have ailments that um, are not visibly evident and where a psychosomatic response could make it appear that the person was healed when he really wasn't. Um, I don't at all want to deny that the Holy Spirit can do miraculous healings. I believe that the Holy Spirit does from time to time do miraculous healings in response to prayer. But the idea that you have to go to somebody like Benny Hinn in order to get that healing is simply absurd. Furthermore, the theology that is presented at those crusades is typically, excuse me, I'm getting hot, is typically that if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. And that <coughs> idea is simply contrary to the scriptures. Jesus healed lots of people who didn't have faith. He even healed people who were dead. Um, in Acts chapter three, where James and John heal the lame man. This man 
uh, apparently does not have saving faith. They just point their finger at him and say, Jesus heals you. I think there's lots of evidence to suggest that healing crusades are generally fake. Now, does that mean necessarily that nobody has the spiritual gift of healing? Not necessarily. But why doesn't Benny Hinn or one of these people who run these crusades go to a local hospital and just walk down the hall and heal person after person after person? If he really has the spiritual gift of healing, he should be able to do that. And when he says you're not healed because you don't have faith, that to me disqualifies the whole idea. Yeah, this, I think this is uh, the word, uh, this whole word of faith movement uh, miss out the idea that of the object of faith is not faith itself, but God. Yeah, very, that's very insightful, Terrence. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, faith has no power. Now, if a person has faith in a promise of God, then God, in his timing, will exert his power to fulfill the promise that he made. But it's not the person's faith that causes the thing to happen. It's the power of God. And as you have pointed out, the word of faith movement encourages people to have faith in faith and faith by itself has no power. So I, I think, I think what you've said is very insightful. Yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, I think it's related to some, uh, issues in relation to the Pentecostal uh, and charismatic movement mm -hmm. uh, on their understanding of uh, dual baptism. Uh, the question is, uh, there are some people who believe that there is a need for a second baptism of the Holy Spirit so mm -hmm. that the Christian can gain maturity in their Christian faith. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to share uh, uh, your opinion on this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Pentecostal theology talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they're not talking about a sound understanding of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which is the believer being baptized into the body at the moment of his salvation. They're talking about something which is typically called the second blessing. And the idea is that you got saved but at some point later in your life, you suddenly rise to a higher level of spirituality. And they typically call this the baptism in the spirit or baptism by the spirit. It's a second baptism idea. Now, they will typically argue that speaking in tongues is evidence of this transition. Well, there are a number of problems with this idea. First of all, um, behind this Pentecostal theology is the idea of Christian perfectionism. It comes from the idea that some, some would claim that you can sort of move up to a sinless state and stay there until you fall out of it. Now, the evidence of scripture is very clear that no believer ever reaches a sinless state. You can go for a time without sinning, but that's not the same as reaching a sinless state. Um, secondly, and we'll talk about this next week a little bit, but in the book of Acts, there are four occasions where individuals speak in tongues. And we have the apostles speaking in tongues, then we have Samaritans speaking in tongues, Gentiles speaking in tongues, and then Old Testament saints who come to faith in Christ speaking in tongues. Now, in the three last cases, these are all spiritually immature people. They speak in tongues. And the purpose of that speaking in tongues, it's a gift that's given by the Holy Spirit just at that moment. And it's not something that continues. And its purpose is to demonstrate that these people have been joined to the body of Christ. Now, it's very clear that they're not mature. In fact, they're newborn members of the body of Christ. So the very idea that speaking in tongues is evidence of a second baptism of the Holy Spirit or elevation to a high level of spiritual maturity goes against all the evidence of scripture. Um, furthermore, second, or 1 Corinthians is the only 
book among the epistles that talks about speaking in tongues. And if there ever was a spiritually immature group of people in the Bible, it's the Corinthians. Paul says, you're not spiritual, you're carnal. You're behaving like babies in Christ. And yet a lot of those people were all excited about the gift of tongues. Now, personally, I'm not convinced that anybody in that church actually had the true spiritual gift of tongues. And we'll talk about that next week. But there's certainly no reason to associate speaking in tongues with a higher level of spiritual maturity. Now, let me throw one more thing out and then we'll move on to our next question. The interesting thing is that a guy named Charles Parham is the father of modern Pentecostalism. He was doing some Bible study on his own. He was not theologically trained. And he came to the conclusion that speaking in tongues was evidence of this second baptism idea. Now, he taught this idea to some followers and among his followers, there was a lady who began to speak in tongues. Now, Parham and all of his followers were convinced that what she was doing was speaking a known human language, which he had never learned, which is exactly what happens in the book of Acts. The gift of tongues in the book of Acts is the miraculous ability to speak a known human language that the speaker has never learned. For example, if I were to start preaching in Hokkien, that would be like the gift of tongues in the book of Acts. Now, they were so convinced that what that woman was doing was speaking a known human language that she had never learned, that they believed that this was going to revolutionary, revolutionize modern missions because missionaries wouldn't have to go to language school. They'd just get the gift of tongues and they'd go to this country or that country and they could speak the language without ever having learned it. And it was only after they discovered that these people weren't speaking known human languages that they changed the idea of speaking in tongues to speaking in an angelic language. So when, when you look at the history of modern Pentecostalism and the idea of this second baptism and its relationship to speaking in tongues, the whole idea of a second baptism falls apart. And the idea that tongues is evidence of special spiritual maturity or reaching a sinless level of perfection just doesn't hold up. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can discuss uh, next week uh, more on uh, speaking in tongues and angelic language. Yes. Um, there's a, uh, I have a piggyback question regarding, uh, you have mentioned uh, a term a while ago, the perfectionism. This mm -hmm. is uh, in the process of sanctification, the Holy Spirit. Uh, some, some believers believe that they will be made perfect. Mm. So it's called perfectionism. Uh, would yeah. you like to... Uh, elaborate on that because uh, people might get confused what that really means and uh, what that entails. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's turn to first John chapter one. And I'm going to read a few verses from here. And as I read, let's keep in mind that this book was written by the apostle John uh, to a group of, of believers. Um, John says in verse five, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now notice what John is saying. He's saying that it's possible for a believer to walk in darkness. That means to behave in a sinful way. It's not good, it's not right, but it's possible. Then he continues and says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Now this cleansing of sin has nothing to do with eternal forgiveness. This is the washing from the kind of sin that comes up in our lives daily. <coughs> then he continues, verse eight, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Notice that John says, we, John is an apostle. There's no question that he's saved and there's no doubt that he was a godly man. And yet he says, even I still have sin. 
He continues in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if I've taken you to this passage before, my apologies, but it doesn't hurt to talk about it again. Um, the point that he's making here has nothing to do with evangelism. This is not about getting saved. This is about a saved person being restored to proper fellowship with God when his sinful behavior has interrupted that fellowship. Notice he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Now, it doesn't say that he's merciful and kind. It says he's faithful and just. In other words, God is obligated to forgive our sins in the sense of cleansing us, in the sense of restoring us to fellowship with him, because we are already in the body of Christ. He has promised that he will do this. And then verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the very fact that John the apostle says that all believers are still sinners and we all still sin. And from time to time, we need cleansing because our sin breaks our fellowship with God is a very strong argument against the idea that anybody could reach a state of sinless perfection. You know, even the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 talks about his own struggle against sin. And he says in uh, verse 15, I think I quoted this before, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not do, but what I hate, that I do. I find then, uh, if then I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And, and the point that he's making is that even after he's saved, there's still this thing that we could call the sin nature. It's a part of us. We haven't lost it. That's why Paul says in Galatians that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. Now he's talking about the Holy Spirit indwelling each believer. The Holy Spirit wants to control us, but our sinful nature also wants to control us. And there's a battle going on inside. And who wins the battle moment by moment depends upon our effort and our willingness to submit to the control and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in obedience to the word. It gets back to the whole issue of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, if it was possible to reach a state of sinless perfection, Paul wouldn't have said, be being filled with the Holy Spirit using a present tense verb, which implies that it requires constant effort. He would have said, be filled, and he would have used a verb that refers to a permanent, achieving a permanent condition, but he didn't use that verb. Now, it's not entirely evident in English, but it would be evident in Greek if he were saying, get to this stage, and from there you can stay there, but you can't. There's no such thing as a sinless Christian. Um, there's no such thing as sinless perfection. We need to constantly struggle against sin. We need to make a continual effort to obey the word and to be filled with the spirit. Yeah, Prof, I think uh, they, through, uh, for some time, there are always some Christian groups uh, mm -hmm. who claims, uh, who believes in perfectionism, maybe like, the holiness movement groups like uh, this group of people. Yeah. Uh, in relation to what you have mentioned of the struggle with sin, mm -hmm. uh, when you say uh, the sinful nature, are you referring to the old nature and the struggle between the old nature and the new nature? Or what, what kind of struggle are you uh, describing here? Well, Paul talks about the old man and the new man. He says, put off the old man, put on the new man. And the idea there, again, is that it's a command. Um, I, I think the best place to sort of understand what's going on here is to go to Romans chapter 6. Right? After Paul has taken us through the explanation of justification, the fact that when you believe the gospel, God imputes to you in a legal sense the righteousness of Christ so that you can never be eternally condemned, he says in the beginning of chapter six, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? In other words, if after we're saved, um, 
we continue to sin, we could do that. And the fact that we don't get condemned would prove how great God's grace is. But his answer is certainly not. How, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, his point isn't that once you are saved and you have died to sin, in other words, sin is no longer able to necessarily control you. He's not saying that you'll never sin again. Let's keep reading. Verse three, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Now listen carefully, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father into resurrection life, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now notice the difference. Christ was raised into resurrection life. We, as a result of that, should walk in newness of life. Now, why does he say should? He says should because it's possible for us not to do it. We should walk in newness of life. We should present our bodies as instruments of righteousness. We should be being filled with the Spirit. We should walk in love. We should allow the Spirit to bear the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. But it takes an effort. You know, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13 Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Again, there's a command to behave in such a way that the fact that you have been saved is evident in your behavior. But Paul hastens to remind us that when we do that successfully, it's because the power comes from God. And again, we're going back to the idea of the filling of the Spirit. Now, Let's go to verse five of Romans six. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be united together with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Now we haven't been resurrected yet, but the fact that we have been identified with Christ in his death means that it's an absolute certainty that we will reach resurrection life. We will get to the sinless state of resurrection life but we're not there yet. Verse six, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now the body of sin won't be done away with until we die, right? It's not until we get out of these mortal bodies that the sin nature will be gone, that the desire and the tendency to sin will be gone from us. Now, um, Paul says, in verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, when he says reckon, he's saying, treat yourself as if you're dead to sin. Now, you're not really dead to sin, but the day is coming when you're going to be dead to sin. So the smart thing to do is now struggle against sin. Seek to control sin in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't give yourself to sin. Give yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness. Verse 12, therefore do not let, do not allow sin to reign in your body, your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now again, what is he saying? He's saying that as a, as a saved mortal, you have the ability to present yourself as an instrument of righteousness to sin. I'm, as, I'm sorry, as an instrument of sin. You can choose to live in a sinful way. It's not the right choice, but you can do it. And all of us do it from time to time. The right thing to do is to present yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness. You can also do that. There's a sense in which a believer between the time of his salvation and the time of his mortal death has more freedom than he's ever going to have at any other time in his existence. Before he was saved, he had no ability to please God. After he gets out of the mortal body, he'll have no ability to displease God. But it's in between these two that we need to make a choice moment by moment. Who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve sin? or are we going to serve God? So again, um, 
the idea that between this and this, we can achieve um, sinless perfection just goes against the scriptures. The very fact that we're constantly exhorted to present ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness is evidence that there's no decisive victory over sin during mortal life. It's a constant battle. I'm not sure that answers the question entirely. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think we are run, uh, we run out of time. Uh, we have some more questions, but uh, we'll reserve uh, those questions for our, our next uh, session. Uh, so before we end this session, can we ask uh, Pastor Christine Molina uh, to close us with the word of prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you once again for this time that we can learn from your word. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that you have given us the Holy Spirit. May you, be, may you fill us, Lord, with your spirit. And may we be able to discover the gift that you have given us and use it to edify one another. Oh, Lord, may you be our presence and may you be our strength. Once again, we thank you for this class and we thank you for Dr. David Din for teaching us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Arthur. And have a blessed day ahead of us. Uh, shalom. Shalom.